Welcome to Mission Majima. Ajahn. Ajahn. So tell us about the Bayabara Sutta Majima number four. So fear and terror is the translation. And it's the Buddha speaking with a Brahmin named Janusoni, uh, who had quite a bit of faith in Savati. And it's his first description of his journey as a bodhisattva, an aspiring practitioner, um, and before he was a Buddha, going into the wilderness and confronting these really difficult practice situations, particularly with fear. And a large portion of the sutta is him examining in his own heart, or looking in his own heart for any of the qualities he see, sees which would give a foothold to fear and terror. Um, so misconduct by body, speech, or mind, or all these other defilements. Seeing them absent, he feels secure in going to practice in the situations, and finds and seeks out particularly difficult ones, actually. And then he provides these very practical, this very practical guidance for how to confront fear, where when it arises, he doesn't change posture until it's subsided. Um, and the mind grows calm. He experiences the three tevija, the insight knowledges, which issue into awakening. So it's the first description of this whole arc we have from the Buddha of going from a, a normal, unenlightened person to a, a Buddha, an enlightened being. Ajahn, what about you? What did uh, what would you like to? What do you think the sutta is trying to say? Um, I think there are two main things the sutta is pointing to. The first is seclusion, this idea of viveka, and the second is facing fear, which you touched on a little bit. In terms of viveka or seclusion, the Buddha talks about three different types of seclusion: kaya viveka or seclusion of body, chitta viveka, seclusion of mind, and upadi viveka, seclusion from attachment. And this sutta really goes in depth into physical seclusion as a basis for mental seclusion, which is the jhanas, the four jhanas, these deep meditative absorptions, the first of which is defined as being secluded from sensuality and being secluded from unwholesome states, uh, the bliss that comes from that. And the third type of seclusion uh, is equivalent to nibbana. So mm -hmm. the whole path can be framed as just increasing skill and nuance in being with seclusion. My favorite non-Buddhist quote is from Blaise Pascal that all of humanity's problems stem from the inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And I think here the Buddha is challenging certainly his monastic disciples, but I think all of us. Um, yeah, can I just be by myself? You don't have to go out to the forest. Just why is it that so many of us, when we do just sit face to face with ourselves and just mind no distractions, mm -hmm. that it, it's so difficult? So... Uh, it's a good challenge. In terms of facing fear, yeah, that practice that the Buddha had of whatever posture he's in, if fear comes up, he doesn't change postures. If he's walking, he doesn't sit or lie down um, or stand. Um, so I think this is, as far as I know, the earliest account of cognitive be behavior therapy, this um, yeah, systematic desensitization or uh, exposure therapy. and. Here the Buddha's in response, you know, not moving in response to fear from outward things in the forest, mm -hmm. but you can use it today with some kind of social anxiety. If you're in a situation which is safe enough and you just feel uncomfortable, then not running away, mm -hmm. physically staying with that, or with a phobia, agoraphobia, or other types of phobia. So really interesting yeah. there. And now, job for yourself, what do you think you'd like to draw out more from this sutta? I think the link between um, sila and ethics and fearlessness is a key component of the practice and of Buddhist thought. And this is the first time you see it kind of indicated. Just there's a, a sutta, the Parinibbana Sutta, Digha Nikaya 16, where the Buddha says the benefits of ethics is one approaches any assembly without fear and dies unconfused. and. So him pointing out in this sutta how the clean heart has no reason to be afraid, I really find it experientially true. Um, whenever my sila gets compromised, there's a sense of, of vulnerability, and I find that so meaningful to see laid out here. I think another really important thing that the sutta introduces is the tevija, the three insight knowledges that the Buddha had 
on the night of his awakening. And the first is of a recollection of his own past lives. Um, the second is a rec recollection of, of Kama, the passing away and coming to being of all beings in line with their actions. And the third is the ending of the asava, um, of the defilements. And what's so interesting there is first it's our initial, our first glimpse of Buddhist cosmology, this infinite series of big bangs and big crunches, uh, inf uh, universe evolution and, and devolution, which was so prescient. But also you see the centrality of rebirth and kama. It's not a peripheral issue to the Buddha. It's not shoehorned in. The two knowledges which preceded his enlightenment were insight into rebirth. So I think that's really important to kind of like raise up and, and take note of. Um, so I, yeah, I, re I really appreciate that about this, this sutta. What kind of new concepts are introduced here for us, Ajahn? What are we encountering for the first time? Yeah, it's fascinating reading the Madhima from beginning to end because the compilers uh, put them in such order that we're gradually introduced to different concepts, which the Buddha will touch on again and again, which are integral to his teaching. So here in this sutta, as you mentioned, actually this is the first instance of a description of samsara, where there's rebirth. Uh, it's the first sutta to a layperson. All the other suttas so far were t taught to monastics. Uh, it's the first mention of the three types of purity, body, speech, and mind. Mm -hmm. It's the first mention of the five hindrances, uh, slightly different wording, but sensuality, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry and doubt. Mm. Uh, it's the first um, elaboration on the uh, four jhanas, these meditative absorptions, the first uh, mention of the three vija, these analytical knowledge, um, and the first time that someone goes for refuge, Janasoni goes to refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha at the mm. end. So, mm. yeah, good stuff we're seeing here. Mm. And for you, how is it personally practice practicable? The cognitive behavioral therapy, you mentioned the exposure therapy of not moving when fear arises or not changing posture. Um, it's, it's such a brilliant piece of advice in disconnecting the reactive self from the emotion. And Long Porpasano was uh, in Kanchanaburi in Western Thailand when a tiger came up to his walking path and this sutta came into his mind and he just kept on walking back and forth until fear had subsided at which point he sat down. And even in a uh, kind of metaphorical way when anxiety or fear or doubt really rises up to keep these words in mind I find to be hugely helpful where you just don't react from that place and you continue you kind of stay the course until a calm state uh, arises where you can act from a, a clear mind so I find that to be very very helpful and, and finally just the Buddha acknowledging that living alone is hard and living in the forest is not easy there's another sutta where he compares one who goes to live in the forest without being ready to a cat, seeing an elephant uh, who he compares to one with jhana frolicking in the water, and the cat tries to jump in the pond and it doesn't go well for the cat. So it's a classic analogy and a good one. Sad so, cat, sad cat. Right. So Ajahn, do you have a uh, sutta or a, sorry, quote for us? Yeah, so this is a very common quote, very happy ending of a sutta. So. Janasoni is inspired and he says, Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. Sadhu. And Ajam, what is the word of the week? The word of the week is Vija, and that comes from the root vid, which means to know. And it means knowledge, uh, understanding. And its antonym is avijja, which in Buddhist thought is the root of all suffering. So it's a key term and one we can all aspire to. Yep. The vijja part, not the avijja part. Well said. So thank you. All right, everybody. Well, we'll see you over on Zoom if you're tuning in live on a Sunday. Um, and we'll see you again next week for Majima number five. Thank you, Ajahn.